I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. There was something so pleasant about that place. Even your emotions have an echo in so much space. Without care, you were out of touch. But it was because I didn't know enough. I just knew too much. Mm-hmm. Does that make me crazy? Does that make me crazy? Does that make me crazy? Possibly. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the Arizal, and the Kabbalists that followed him, especially in the Hasidic movement, they all said that you'll know Mashiach's coming when there will be a thirst for Kabbalah throughout the world, meaning everyone's going to want to know the mystical aspects of creation, that then you'll know it's time for Mashiach. So it's kind of cool that, like, you know, here we are in this wild period of Jewish history. I mean, we're in the ultimate period of Jewish history, the, the Messianic era. You know, we get to be part of it. We're watching it literally unfold in front of our eyes, you know, right right beyond this this class you're hearing in Jerusalem is is the Temple Mount, you know, like when were Torah classes taught here? You know, we are on the other edge of history. It's really exciting. The... But, and all the Kabbalists said that in the end of days there will be a thirst for Kabbalah, and we've all witnessed that as well. And they all said it, like all the key Kabbalists said it, the Baal Shem Tov said it. And the, you know, they, all, they all said that there will be a great thirst for Kabbalah. And that it's only, and when the Kabbalah goes out there into the world, that we're going to see redemption. And it's amazing that the generation of Bali Tshuva, which is an un, it was an unprecedented, gigantic wave that hit in 1967, it all began, and interestingly, you know when it all began? It, it, there was a date. Do you know the Baal Tshuva movement had a date? Yeah, what was the date in it? June 5th, 1967. Did you know it had a date? <laughs> Most people don't know. The Baal Tshuva movement, the call back to Torah of secular Jews was June 5th, 1967. And you know what June 5th was, 1967? It was the sixth day of the sixth sphera. Yisod, Shebi Yisod, when the sixth day war began. The sixth day the Sixth Sphere, the Sixth Day War. 666. <laughs> the second category of Kabbalah is meditation. It's using names of God. There's many names of God, and you use the names of God and to go on uh, trips, if you will, to trip on the names of God and to go on these journeys, meditative journeys. You go into meditation and you take these journeys into parallel realms, that, which we discussed a little bit, going into these parallel realms and, and going on these, these journeys. You are giant. Each one of us is giant. And this, by the way, I'm just going to bring up, it's a separate subject, but this is God's plan, is that you're giant. And you actually happen to also be giant, but the, this is God's plan, is that, is that God created every single human being, Jew and Gentile, Black man, white, B'Tselem Elohim, with the image of God inside of him or her. So every person is giant. But you can't govern people who think that. So what governments have done throughout the world is they push them down and make them small. 
And so governments throughout the world have pushed down leaders of whole communities. Every country was led by medicine men, by the men who understood the giantness of every individual. Until, of course, the machine comes in. Welcome to the machine. And, and wipes out whatever Amazon jungle civilization that was, and especially the medicine man, who teaches everyone how big they are. And we are that exact representation. The only difference is God chose us at Sinai to be this nation that's going to like cross the finish line. Like, through, at the end of history, we're going to cross through the tape of the finish line. We are the model nation of the world to tell everyone that every individual is giant. And you'll notice when those same shamanistic substances hit America in the late 1960s, it was all legal. What did anyone know from it? And as soon as they discovered that it makes an individual giant, and you realize you can't govern people like that, it immediately got classified as legal. Sorry, as illegal. These are the guys who founded these companies. And they're like, oh, you want to make that illegal? That's cool, you know. We'll just work in high tech for a while. You know, so they go into high tech. And they created what's called the personal computer. Which again, the government didn't know better. It was like, oh, that looks innocent enough. Help yourselves. I remember my first computer with the floppy disks and stuff. We were like, we didn't think anything of it. But slowly but surely, it was whittling its way down to the power of an individual to make gigantic changes in the world with just one little press of a button. Whole governments, despots, dictators, torn down with social networking. The power of the individual is back. And it was the same people they put down in the 60s created it. It's all part of the process of, that I've been teaching you guys for a couple weeks now of God shamanizing creation. There's a big part of it, and the biggest part is it has to do with digital, but we're not gonna go there right now. Are you here today to learn how to make more money within the system that we are trying to escape? Or are you here to learn how you can be free as individuals? Blockchain Island has become one of the more friendly habitats for crypto in 2018. Leading the way in official government blockchain legislature, welcoming all explorers of the future to the Maltese coast. With its rich history from the Knights of Templar to the Holy Grail, this island always had something magical about it. It is this magic that was captured by Iman Poulos and formulated into one of the leading blockchain gatherings from the get-go with over 8,500 attendees flocking to Malta. Hello everyone. I apologize that uh, it's been a, a while between videos. I've kind of been in the middle of a rather intense uh, time of, of both reflection and just absorbing a certain type of material that's been pretty pretty heavy and, and a bit conflicting uh, I admit in terms of just trying to figure out like what is the baseline emphasis that needs to be brought forward in terms of talking about this material and going through it because there's so many so many avenues you could go down and so many things you could focus on I only played a few clips there. That was of a, a man by the name of Rabbi Yom Tov Glaser. And I've been watching a number of his lectures and presentations. And there's honestly, I could have played dozens and dozens of clips of things that are just <laughs> going on and on. Um, touching upon so many things that uh, I've actually been exploring over the past several years in terms of cosmology and how that bleeds into physics and then what are all the mystical and occult uh, connections to the origins of these ideas and how they've progressed and where are they going and and so on the one hand it's not that i really heard anything new per se but hearing it all coming out of the same mouthpiece and in the way that it it's presented that just just his whole persona is uh, kind of fascinating and it's been a it's just been a very sobering experience um, listening to him 
and then seeing the connections to so many other things, right, that are, it just gets bigger and bigger, and it's so, this touches upon so many things, whether it's in terms of Bible prophecy, understanding, co you know, cosmology, and occult questions with, you know, unseen worlds, and um, archetypal representations of uh, the spiritual realm. That's kind of a topic that stuck out to me since first getting into this, all these questions about biblical cosmology. The whole idea of a cosmograph. Okay, and cosmographs are, of course, just like they sound, a graph or a map of the cosmos, and that can take the form of, you know, the materialistic Big Bang universe, <laughs> or can function on spiritual or dimensional levels, which, of course, is what the Kabbalistic Tree of Life really is. It is like a dimensional map. And when you listen to this guy, Glaser, I mean, it... It's pretty wild to just hear somebody boiling down the essence of so many of these Kabbalistic teachings that were kept secret, more or less, to the vast majority of the population, whether Jew or Gentile, for hundreds if not thousands of years, and now it is being broadcast and taught, and that opening video is from just a Kabbalah 101 lecture, and yes, that backdrop is his backdrop. I didn't add that in there. That's their chosen iconography, and hopefully the selection that I chose kind of really at least tries to encapsulate just a tiny bit of all the stuff he goes into, because not only is he really blatantly and openly explaining that uh, what Kabbalah is, in terms of it being a pantheistic uh, simulation theory, basically, <laughs> uh, belief system, where the Hebrew alphabet is believed to be the the metaphysical fabric of the universe by which God quote unquote creates everything, but he really emanates everything to it. So it is the same New Age pantheistic gospel. It's monism, but it's a special Jewish monism. So you can talk about God as a personal being, but really he's not a personal being. We don't know anything about him, but we know all this stuff about him. <laughs> or we know all about all these gradations, all these dimensional it's a ladder obviously. And that's it's exactly how they kind of view history. And another thing about this uh, Rabbi Glaser is that you can actually glean a really mind-blowingly uh, transparent glimpse of his views on eschatology as a Jew living in Jerusalem, teaching, you know, his classroom, literally, like, you know, he'll, like, open the window, and, oh, yeah, there's the the wailing wall, like, literally right outside the window. He's right there in the thick of it and sponsored by this university in Heidebrut, which is a big TV station in Israel, and um, he travels around the world. He's this California guy who, uh, I believe, probably had first-hand experience with a lot of uh, other kinds of, you know, quote-unquote shamanistic spirituality, New Age spirituality, before uh, coming back to his Jewish identity and becoming observant and then becoming a rabbi. And his specialties are Kabbalah and uh, psychotherapy. And, yeah, and again, one-stop shop kind of kind of place where you can see, like, how even something like modern psychotherapy modern psychology, so much is actually derived from Kabbalah. And and I think one of the things that is, this really brings to the surface is this misconception that so many people who are looking into these things and studying these things from a Christian prophetic angle is the idea that, you know, whether it's th a focus on the, the Noahide laws question or about just you know what the powers that should not be are doing or in terms of like mind control and brainwashing and just turning everyone into slaves and you know in, imposing all kinds of things upon uh, the population or population you know control or population reduction all these kinds of you know, themes that that come up again but in re but the whole issue of how in reality the things that this guy is teaching uh, to other, you know, he's teaching Kabbalah to other, to he young Hebrew, like, college-aged kids from all over the world, and teaching them that Kabbalah is the essence, it's not just some branch, some offshoot, or some sect of Judaism, that it is the, the core, it's one of the pillars of Judaism, and that the mystical side of Kabbalah, the spiritual side, explains what the Talmud is really all about, and the Talmud explains what the Torah is all about. That's essentially their view, those three pillars. So, in the course of the that three pillars, that progression, it's imperative for, for people in the, the prophecy community, the truth community, whatever you want to call it, cosmology discussions, to understand that A, <laughs> Judaism, quote-unquote, is not what so many people just assume that it is, that it is 
that it's just the, the Old Testament without the New Testament. They just believe in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, just like we do. They just don't believe in Jesus. And that in itself is patently not true to really understand what is at the core of their belief system in terms of how they even define God. But their definitions of everything, everything in the Torah has been completely turned around, uh, turned inside out, upside down. It's, it's complete opposite in every way. And that's um, not an accident. Because when you reject the, the true Messiah, when you re reject Jesus, that the entire Torah, that the entire Mosaic Law, and the, the entire Old Testament was pointing to and could only be fulfilled by, but then you want to still cling to that and reject Jesus, well then you're, of, there's no avoiding a, a complete and utter perversion and inversion of it. So that's what has absolutely happened. But one of the crazy things is when you, you see all these correlations between the space deception, this whole heliocentric paradigm controversy, or, you know, people just, oh, it's about sun worship, and, and no, it's understanding that it, it really is about getting people to believe in things outside of what they could normally see. Because you can't see these planets and see all these distant worlds and see everything that the Hubble telescope can capture. But it's giving you... It's just even that basic of giving people like something to kind of... To go and, and, and imagine like parallel worlds. That's essentially what a planet functions as archetypally, once again. Oh, there's this other world where like... And it's fine if you want to think about, like, you'd have to get on a rocket or a spaceship and fly there, but there's another there somewhere. There's another place where you can get out and walk around and, you know, the sky looks different and the ground looks different and <laughs> the gravity is different. Maybe the physics in that part of the universe are different. So it's just a, it's just a materialistic construct, once again, for what is ultimately a metaphysical idea of higher realms, a strata of realms. Okay. And this is what Kabbalah teaches and believes in. And he goes into a lot of detail about this and talks about how there's some that, like, if you see them, you know, you'd, you'd go mad. You wouldn't even be able to feed yourself if, you know, if you were to get a glimpse of this sphera, that sphera. So the ten spherot are these emanations, these levels, and then there's levels within levels, and it's, you know, it's just a big labyrinth of dimensional gateways and... <laughs> breakdowns and, you know, just like every occult system, it's just this very elaborate labyrinthian pyramid maze up to the top, you know, because that's the whole point is that we're going <laughs> to, both individually and corporately, the idea is that they are going to metaphysically resurrect themselves, essentially going up this dimensional ladder and using their Torah observance, quote unquote, using their, their application of the mitzvahs. <laughs> their works in this quantum spirit quantum mysticism way it's not even and it's coming out of his own mouth like it is there's nothing hidden so for the person who is either a thinks that all this idea about questioning physics and questioning the quantum stuff if you think that's weird oh well that's just science then uh, you might want to listen to what the kabbalists have been teaching for a long long time or simultaneously so many of the people that are in these various you know gradations or strains of what we might in a broader sense call the hebrew roots movement so much could be said um in terms of really understanding like i understanding that yes judaism is not just the old testament without the new testament it's not just that oh yeah they they threw on the Talmud, but uh, we don't. We reject the Talmud, but there's still this Jewishness that's been lost by the the pagan Christian, you know, the the Protestants and the Catholics and all this European. They've, we've lost the Jewish essence of Jesus and all the stuff. That's it's very subtle, and yet um, I think so many of these folks just really do not even know what they are messing with, what they are toying with, really. This idea of being fascinated by all things the Hebrew, whether culturally, linguistically, the, the names of God, you know, do you say Jesus or do you say Yeshua? And uh, then on from there. But I mean, if so many of these people truly understood that, like, Hebrew is not just a language to, to these Jews, to these Kabbalists. And again, 
Glaser makes it very clear that like the same rabbis who wrote the Talmud are the same rabbis who wrote all the Zohar. It's the same dudes. It's the, it's the same names. It's the same tradition. It has to have an oral law. There's no way for our Torah without an oral law. If you don't have an oral law for our Torah, you don't have a Torah. So once you say the Torah is divine, what does that mean about the oral law, the instructions? That they're also divine. It's just the rabbis throughout the generation transmitting down the generations how to do the mitzvahs. How do you actually do them? Most of oral law is just how to do the mitzvahs. I know a lot of people have issues with rabbis and stuff, but really they're just trying to explain how to complete a mitzvah from beginning to end. How do you do the mitzvah? That's the oral law, how to do the mitzvah. Well, we also have this amazing, giant body of information called the Kabbalah, which explains everything else. How God created the world, how God runs the world, what is the real reason behind all the mitzvahs. The Kabbalah on all of that. Well, who are the rabbis that you find in the Zohar, the book that got written down during Roman persecution? Who are the rabbis when you open up the actual Zohar that are in this dialogue with each other? And the answer is the same exact rabbis of the oral law that tell you how to make a period to tefillin or how to keep Shabbat or how to slaughter an animal. One stop shop. It's the same dudes. You see, these days, if you want a, a halachtician, a man who knows Jewish law, you go to this rabbi. You want a Kabbalist? You go to the Kabbalist. In those days, one-stop shop, it was the same guy. It's the same exact guy. So when you open up a Mishnah that's telling you how to build a mikvah, or how to make a pair to fill in, or how to keep Shabbat, or how to slaughter an animal, when you open up the Mishnah, it says, Rebbe Meir said this, Rebbe Akiva said this, Rebbe Shimon said this, Rebbe, uh, Rebbe uh, Tarfun said this, when you open up the Zohar, guess how it reads? Rabbi Akiva said this, Rabbi Shimon said this, Rabbi Meir said this, Rabbi Tarfin said this, Rabbi Ishmael said this, Rabbi Hillel said this. It's the same names. It's the same exact people. So if you're going to trust them for how to keep Shabbat, if you're going to trust them for who is a Jew today, if you're going to trust them for how to make a mikvah and how to judge when, when someone should get in that mikvah or not, if you're going to trust the rabbis on all of that, which we trust them for all of it, even that you're a Jew today is only rabbinic. We only understand that through the rabbis. The Torah doesn't define it. Everything is rabbinic. So if you're going to trust the rabbis for you being a Jew today, it's the same rabbis who teach us all these amazing mystical secrets of creation. Same dudes. One stop shop. You can't remove the core of Kabbalah. It is at the core. It is the heart of it all. And in the core of that belief system is the idea that the, the Hebrew language, they believe that a, God created everything through it, that it's like through, through like magical, just like the Matrix, except like little Hebrew quanta of information. I mean, you hear the, <laughs> you hear Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson and all these quantum physicists talking about this like the universe is made up of little quanta little bits little packets of information whatever the, you know they it's the same idea kapala was talking about this hundreds of years before all these physicists were that the that the, that the whole creation is literally like what you see in the matrix except you know hebrew and so hebrew is like the magic words of god the names of god they literally treat as spells Their whole concept of the scriptures is that it's basically a big grimoire of spells. These special divine spells. That they as Jews are specially like anointed, specially gifted to be able to apply and use to redeem the world. To redeem Israel, to fight the man. I mean that's what's so crazy too is that there's a lot of truther, you know, zeitgeisty rhetoric that comes out of uh, Glazer's talks, like a lot, you know, talking about the machine, you know, never mind the fact that Rothschild Street is just probably a stone's throw away from where he's teaching that class. You know, what is the machine? <sighs> 
but uh, even in that context, yeah, it's like no, we're we're fighting this this. You know, he'll talk about it. It's like that's Western civilization. And then on, on the other side, there's the threat of Islam and all these billions of Muslims. And you know, so in his mind, it's like yeah, we're the we're the like the knights of God's purpose to to, to show everyone how big we are, like how we're really part of God. It's all this language. It's the same New Age language. You're really uh, your full potential is is like you don't even know. I mean, this is the same thing that like Hollywood is teaching all the time and the mainstream media. It's really so it's like is that really is the truth quote unquote being occulted from you if that's if there's any truth in this and that's the, the other thing is that so many people they get they get sucked into this idea that they're only misappropriating these occulted truths. they're only um, abusing their 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 special knowledge. <laughs> all they have is delusion. all they have is fantasy. That, that has been fed to them by the enemy but not, not <laughs> they've been seduced by it just like we've always been just going back to the Garden of Eden It's there's nothing new under the sun and again I'm not trying to say this to discount the whole thing about the Noahide laws and uh, the realities that are progressing with that but the, the real where the rubber really meets the road where you really start to stand against the Antichrist um, agenda is when you just bring it back to Jesus and the cross. And there's just so much stuff that people are talking about, whether they're totally Zionist and pro-Israel or, or completely the opposite. You know, still thinking in political terms and, and economic terms, but again, not understanding that all those things flow out of the spiritual reality, the spiritual agenda is going on, and it all centers around the person of Jesus Christ. It all centers around the question of, what does salvation mean? What does redemption mean? What is the end? What What is your eschatology? Because he has an eschatology. Like, very developed, and it's fascinating, because on the one hand, it's like, yeah, everyone's God, but there's also all these nations out here that are this legit military existential threat, and God's going to have us, he's going to give us military victory, so it's very worldly, but also kumbaya, you know, it's, it's like cognitive dissonance. It's a, it's a trip. Listen, listening to this guy is a trip. And, um, I don't know, but they're, I mean, he even talks about, like, the divine feminine and Sophia, and I mean, every, you name it. Yeah, technology and the shamanizing of the world and how all these different shamanic cultures and, and, and everything embody the same thing. They teach the same thing. They just believe that they, as the Jews, have, like, the purest form of this sacred knowledge, this wisdom. Like, other people, all these other Gentile nations just get little glimpses of it with their ayahuasca and their different plants that they ingest and everything, but, you know, we've got, like, the the hardcore. And in some ways, it's like, yeah, that might be true, but it's it's not the hardcore truth of God. It's hardcore, it's like hardcore devotion to a system that is straight out of the mouth of someone else. And like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty heavy. Because the war is against the message of the cross. Not any of this other stuff. People want to believe in one day flying to another planet or ascending up this dimensional ladder as they find their way, way back to source and their own divinity. But it's all, it's just a siren song. It's a fantasy. It's an illusion. It's a self-delusion where the people are willingly choosing a lie over the truth. They're choosing to believe in any of these things because they don't want to believe that they're a sinner in need of a savior. And um, coming back to that realization has kind of, in some ways, really affected, like I said, just my, just the energy that I find myself being able to spend digging into all this stuff versus trying to live my own life, like, in the, <laughs> in the real world. And, um learning to let let myself even experience joy or just um just the small things that you know i've f for such a long time been so preoccupied with all this this craziness and all this deception that i barely uh, just it's like i just completely lost the ability to even enjoy the simple pleasures and the simple blessings that god is putting around us all the time 
whether it's just a beautiful sunny day or going for a walk in his creation and things like that, that I'm just finding myself being nourished by just having the peace that comes from knowing that God is with us right now. We're not, we're looking ahead to his coming, but we're not deceiving ourselves. When you look at all these people that they, they, they have no concept of what are even a relationship with God really means. And we have that right now. We get to enjoy that even now even in the midst of all this stuff. But like God is already like here and loving us and walking us through it all, through his grace. And because of that, we don't have to lose our minds because of all this <laughs> delusion and, and fantasy chasing going on because it's only gonna continue on until he finally returns.